Well, it's that time of year again, Christmas. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people's favorite time of year. And, and we start thinking about the Christmas story. And we start thinking about how remarkable and incredible the Christmas story is. And I'm going to tell you, some people have a hard time believing in all the things that the, the Bible says, that the accounts of, of Matthew and Luke say happened in the events leading up to Christmas. There's a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of, is that really it? And some people even just look at it and say, you know what, I've, I, I've, I've done my history. People, a long time ago, they really tried to figure out what happened with Jesus. And really this, this birth narrative, this, this Christmas story is just to give him a little street cred. It's to get, you know, you have this, this amazing thing that happened with his life and his death, and, and so it had to start great. It had to start in this amazing way. But I'm here to tell you, I, like, the most impressive, the most incredible part of Jesus' life isn't Christmas. It isn't his birth. If you've been around here long enough, you've, you've probably heard me say, right, like, the, like if, if a guy can predict his own death and resurrection and get it right, that's pretty special. And it is, and that's what, that's what is the most special, the most unbelievable, impossible thing that, that, that Jesus predicted his own death and his own resurrection, and he got it right. And so if you take that into account, the birth narrative, the story of Jesus being born is not impossible, it's just very remarkable. But really the story of Christmas it didn't start with a, a young couple not knowing exactly how one of them became pregnant. It starts way before that. It doesn't start with a couple not knowing where they're going to have a place to have their baby. In fact, it starts well before that. It starts with a couple who are in their 70s who don't have a baby and are pretty sure they're never going to have one. You see, the story of Christmas doesn't start in Matthew or Luke. The story of Christmas starts all the way back in Genesis. And the story of Christmas doesn't begin 2,000 years ago from right now. It begins over four. You see, the story of Christmas, the story of Christmas begins with, in, with this, this promise in Genesis. And this promise, it was, it was unbelievable and at times incoherent and absolutely impossible. And it starts with this unbelievable, incoherent, impossible promise given not to Mary and Joseph, but to a, a man named Abraham. You see, when you look at Genesis, and, I, and when you look at Genesis, like, don't just think of the Bible as the Bible, right? I mean, the Bible is the Bible, but, but the Bible was put together, put together over, over a thousand years, almost 2,000 years worth of, of story, it depends when you think Job is written. And, and when you think, I mean, it's like 3,000 years of history that, that God has been acting within human history, and he wants to ensure that that, that that documentation of that is being preserved. And so if you go to Genesis, you go to Genesis, you can see God talks to Abraham about 2,090 years before Jesus is on the scene. And so think about this. The Christmas story starts even longer from the time, so from the time from Jesus to us, 2,000 years. Well, think about this. The time from Abraham to Jesus is even longer than that. Not by much. That's a long time. It's a long time to wait for a promise to be fulfilled, to wait for a, to see how something plays out. And, and, and Abraham hears this unbelievable, incoherent, impossible promise. 
and he does something that I think is impossible too. He chose to believe it. And so in Genesis 12, we read this. Now the Lord said to Abram, and he, 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 that's his name, Abram, before the Lord changes his name to Abraham, and that's, that happens a lot, so no big deal. It says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, he, he basically means I want you to leave this place, to leave the dirt that you grew up in. I want you to leave the familiarity. I want you to leave the place where you have a reputation, a 75-year reputation, where you have standing, where, you're, where you have protection with your family, and, and you have wealth, and you have history, and I want you to go someplace. And it's not like how he told Joseph in, in, in that Christmas story. He says, I want you to go to a place, and you're going to walk, and then when I tell you that you're there, then that's when you're going to stop. And that's incredible. And then he says this, you're going to get up, you're going to go, you're going to leave. And, and, and he does that. But there's another, another part of the promise. And he says, and I will make you a great nation. It's like, what a great nation? I'm 75, God. I have no children. I would like to be a grandfather by now. I would like to have more kids than zero. It says, I will make your name great. I will make you famous. And he's like, what do you mean? I mean, I have no one to pass my lineage on, no one to talk about me except for my immediate family after I'm dead. You're not going to make me famous. And, and, that, and that so that you will be a blessing. Okay. And then he says this, I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you in verse 3. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And so he says, listen, I'm not going to give up on this. Starting with you, Abraham, I, I'm making you a promise that I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless others that, that are join in with my work. And then those who, who don't bless you, who dishonor you, I'm going to, if they have a problem with you, they also have a problem with me. And then he says this, and all... And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, that was a big deal, right? Because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make you a great nation. That was, that was caught. I mean, people came from lowly beginnings, though it didn't happen often. They came from lowly beginnings. And if you were a good enough warrior, if you were a good enough leader, you were a good enough king, you could be a great nation. And, and, People's names, were, there were famous people back then, just like there are now, and people were blessings, and, and there were people that walked around that said, oh, man, you know, I have, I've been blessed by God, and the people, you know, when things went their way, they said, well, that, that was God blessing me, and then there was, there was violence and opposition, so people tried to oppose you, and there was damage done to them. All of that is very commonplace, but this last little bit, this is the, the part that I think makes it incoherent until right at the very end. It says, all the families on the earth shall be blessed. You see, that was so different. Every group, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every place that Abraham's never even been or thought of or knew existed, those people in those places are going to be blessed by you, through you, in you. God promises it. You see, that was so weird because nations didn't bless. People didn't bless other people. People protected their people. They didn't bless other people. They didn't, they didn't bless other nations. Nations didn't bless. No, what did they do? They conquered. They enslaved they eradicated. They plundered. They did not bless. They did not bless. But so Abraham, he hears this promise, this unbelievable, incoherent, again, it's, it's mind-blowing, impossible promise, and he believes. And God begins making good on the promise. Now, he's 75 when the promise is made. He doesn't have a child until he's 99, 100 years old. 
but they have a child. Him and his wife, Sarah, finally have a child. And nobody is really that blessed. (laughs) I mean, Abraham is. He has a child finally. But other nations weren't like, yay. They, they didn't, they don't know. They, you know, here's this little, you know, here's a wealthy, you know, sheep herder, a wealthy, a wealthy rancher in a forgotten part of the world. Great. No, no one made much of him. And he had a son. And then his son has a couple of kids. And then <laughs> that son has you know, some kids, a lot of kids, 12. And then the whole nation happens. And let me just tell you, if you ever want to, you know, this Christmas season, if you think, man, my my, my family's kind of dysfunctional, just read about Abraham's. It'll make yours way, seem way, way, way better. I mean, all of this happened, right? And Abraham wasn't just going around blessing everybody, blessing everybody. What did he do? He lied. You know, he lied. Whenever he, he was walking south, uh, from where he was living, he gets to Egypt. The, the Pharaoh, you know, the, the, the leader of Egypt sees his wife and says, man, is she single? And he's like, yep, that's my sister, right? I mean, bad, 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 bad. That cannot have been a good thing for their marriage. Uh, and so he lies about that. The truth finally comes out. Pharaoh's mad, kicks him out. He goes back. He, he goes and I mean, there's all kinds of hijinks and all kinds of junk, and, and he has Isaac, and then, and then Isaac has Jacob, right? And, and Jacob, that his name probably shouldn't be there. It should be Esau. Esau was the oldest child. He's the one who deserved it, who, who deserved it by birth order. But Esau let his, his desires and his, uh, his hunger get the best of him, and Jacob essentially stole the blessing, stole what was his. And then he has 12 sons, and 10 of them or 11 of them are out, and they hate one of them, uh, and, they, and, they, and they go out, and they, uh, they hate the one, and they throw him down in a pit, and, and they argue, and they're like, hey, we can do one of two things. We can murder him, or we can sell him into slavery, and they think about it, and they're like, well, he's gone either way, but we can make money off of one and not off of the other. And so they say, okay, we're going to make some money off of this deal. And they sell him to a slave trader who takes him down to Egypt, and he becomes a slave. And this happens. I mean, this, like, nobody is feeling blessed. Now, it, you know, he blesses, you know, there's blessings along the way. Eventually, the whole nation of Israel uh, moves to Egypt because of, the, of, of selling the one son into slavery. He, be, he rises through the ranks. He becomes a leader. There's a famine where, uh, near Jerusalem and where, uh, where the, all, this, all, the, all of Israel lives. And then they come to Egypt to live, but eventually they're not wanted and they become slaves there. <laughs> The whole nation is not feeling super blessed and not in any position to bless others as a nation, as a people that are enslaved. They're enslaved. They're in no position to bless anybody, right? And then what happens? Okay, so God sends Moses. God sends Moses, and and, and Moses, you know, tells Pharaoh, let my people go, and and there's 12 plagues, uh, and these plagues are, I mean, they're horrible, and you know who's not feeling blessed? Egypt. I mean, they're feeling so unblessed, they they let all their slaves go. They they send them out, get out of here. We're tired of all this bad stuff happening. And so they, uh, you know, take a, a 40-year camping trip in, in, uh, in uh, the desert, the Sinai Desert. They do this 40, 40-year camping trip, and then they go, to, they, they go to, to Canaan. They go to the land, with the, which they call flowing with milk and honey, and God says, go, like, I'm going to give you this land. This is the land of Jerusalem. I'm giving it to you from the Canaanites. And so what did they do? They go and take it. They take it by military force. You know who didn't feel blessed? All the Canaanites who either got wiped out, destroyed, or their house plundered and taken, and they, were, they went somewhere else. They were not being blessed. 
Now, I'm going to say, if, a little aside here, if you look at the violence in the Old Testament, there, there's so much of it, right? And that violence was not blessing. But the violence in the Old Testament is not really a good argument against the existence or the goodness of God. What it really is is it's, a, it's an indictment in a, of a culture, of a worldwide culture, that placed no value on human life. No value on human life, right? If you were to ask these people, hey, is this, is this violence? Is this really violence? They would go, oh, no, no. They're like, like real violence is this other guy. I mean, they would, it's just how they were. Now, it strikes us as violent. It strikes us as cruel and terrible and awful because we are 2,000 years on this side of Christmas. But on the other side of Christmas, it's very different. And so a thousand years after God promises Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, you're going to be famous, I'm going to make your name great, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless those who bless you, I'm going to curse those who curse you, and I'm going to bless the entire world through you. Through you, the entire world will be blessed. They finally, the the nation of Israel, the the people of Abraham finally are in a position to do that. Through lots of trial, King David rises through the ranks. He's an unlikely warrior king. He rises through the ranks. He begins to, to conquer. And Israel, because through King David, he created peace because he he's now Israel is both feared and respected. Through this warrior king, Israel is feared and respected. And then David, he has some sons, and they're a mess too. Read about that. I mean, again, dysfunctional families all throughout the Bible. It's not just you and your house, not just me. His son Solomon becomes king. David's son, the wisest man to live, he becomes king. And he moves them just from being feared and respected to then they become feared, respected, wealthy, and influential. I mean, this, you know, they have, the, they have all that it takes to be a, a nation that is able to bless others. And they blow it. You have the warrior king in David. You have the builder king in Solomon. And instead of blessing others and pointing people to the God of Abraham, Solomon begins marrying hundreds of daughters and you know, relatives of the kings of these other, other places. And instead of pointing people to the God of Abraham, the nation of Israel is drug into idol worship and, and these pagan practices and worshiping these other gods. And, and, and God, he had made this promise to Solomon and he had made this promise to David that, like, listen, I, I, if, if, you, if you remain true to me, then I will remain true to you. But if you don't, then I will not, like, I will I will cast you, you know, I will, I will, I will strike, strike down the hammer and, and, and take away all your influence and your wealth and your, your reverence that people have for you. And that's what happens. Solomon continues to do this. The nation is divided. The temple is destroyed. And basically what God says is, hey, I'll tear it down. I don't need it. I'm up to something any bigger anyways. And so the best opportunity in a thousand years is squandered for, for, for Israel to live up to the promise that God made. It's an opportunity lost because now they have a divided, they have a divided uh, nation, they have a decimated military, and you fast forward 300 years to about 700 BC, and the northern kingdom is lost. They're, they're conquered. They are no more. It is not a nation. It is not a people of, of the God of Abraham, who fear the God of Abraham. 
And the southern kingdom, which is called Judah, it is on the verge of implosion, and it's on the verge of invasion. And they can't really keep themselves together, much less bless anybody else. And God speaks through the prophet Isaiah. Again, we call it the Bible, but this is, this is you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, 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 and Isaiah writes this down, and it gets preserved and kept because things aren't going well, right? 1,200 years after Abraham has given this promise, they're not going well. The northern kingdom is, has abandoned God altogether. The southern kingdom is, is on its way. The, the Assyrian king, uh, Sennacherib, is, is right there, right there, besieging Jerusalem. And, and, and King Hezekiah, he surrenders so that Jerusalem can be a vassal state. And in the midst of that, Isaiah writes, Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you as a light for the nation that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. I'm gonna make you a light. And through you, my salvation will go out to the ends of the world, to the darkest regions. And, and I'm sure people are hearing that. They're hearing this prophet going, are you kidding me? Maybe, maybe 200 years ago when David and Solomon reigned, maybe that we could do that. But a light? It's a joke. Salvation? Are you kidding me? We can't even save ourselves, right? They, and right after Isaiah writes this, they lose their independence to Assyria. And over the next 300 years, chaos ensues. The Babylonians invade, and they conquer them. The city is sacked, the temple is destroyed, the best and brightest are, taking to, are taken to, uh, to Babylon, right? So they're just left with not very great, not very smart, not very good people. And then they bring in Babylonians to help kind of resettle the city and make it not what it was. And then God sends another prophet. He sends Malachi. If about 436 B.C., right, everything has happened. Malachi, Malachi is the final voice of God to the people of Israel. He's the final prophet to come. And he's going to say this, he's going to share this at a time when Israel couldn't bless itself, much less anyone else. Malachi 1.11 says this, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nation, says the Lord of hosts. And you know who listened? Nobody. Nobody. So God doesn't speak for 440 years. But he still made this promise, right? Then why would they listen? The nation of Israel is going, okay, we're going to be a blessing. We had our chance 500, you know, six, almost 600 years ago, we had our chance, and we blew it. And we've been overrun by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians, and now the Greeks were coming. They can't bless themselves. How can they bless anybody else? How can, how can the name of the Lord be great among the nations when the name of the Lord is not great amongst its own people? So the Greeks come and then the Romans come. And in 63 B.C., Pompey, the, 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 the great general Pompey, rides his horse they, they, he, 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 he besieges Jerusalem. He rides his horse into the temple. It's, it's a huge show of force. He rides his horse into the temple, and he gets to the Holy of Holies. If you've been around, that's the place where, where God dwells. The, the Israelites were not, there was one person each year was allowed to go in 
That was it. And he rides his horse, right? This, this, Roman, this Roman pagan general rides in. He, he pulls back the curtain and he walks in. And you know what he sees? Nothing. He sees nothing. It, th- that, that temple is empty. The Holy of Holy, the place where they say that God dwells, is empty. It has no image of God. There are no statues. And Pompey says, what a pathetic religion this is. They have no gods, meaning they have no, no images, no, no, no statues. Their God is invisible, and why not? Because he let them get, he let the, he let them get ransacked. He let them get destroyed and overtaken. You see, nobody was interested in a God that was invisible and impotent against Rome. And so here are these these Israelite people, these Hebrew people, and they're known for their stubborn loyalty to this this invisible, inactive God. And, And when things seem to be the most hopeless... So for 700 years, 800 years, Israel is a pawn, is a pawn on the world stage there in the ancient, North, uh, ancient Near East. It's a pawn with what people thought was an invisible, impotent God. And that's when he decides to speak. That's when the promise was as hopeless as it was ever possible. Right? The, the, the promise that God would bless everyone, every nation through the people of Abraham, through Abraham and his seed. That's when God speaks. When it was out of reach as, as, as it could possibly be, Paul writes about this in Galatians 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, like it was, God had made all the preparations and it was now ready. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. When God had everything the way he wanted it. And this is how, this is how incredible and impossible and, and, it's, and incoherent when you're, on the other, when you're on the other side of it, it's incoherent and how Unbelievable, the real, the, the real beginning of Christmas is. He had everything the way he wanted it. The Roman Empire had expanded. You have the, the Pax Romana. You have the, 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 the peace that was instilled by Rome, that things were peaceful. You had a road system that would travel all the civilized area, right? All of civilization had was experiencing peace, all of civil, relative, and all civilization was experiencing communication with roads and ports, and there was a common language that people knew, a business language that people knew, and through all of that, through all of that, there was a mechanism by which the whole world, by the whole world, could be brought to attention. But not only that, So not only had he had everything the way he wanted it condition-wise, he also knew the condition of Israel, that Israel was not in a position to bless themselves. They couldn't help themselves, much less bless anybody else, that if the nation of Israel was going to be a blessing to the whole world, it was going to be only by God's hands, and it was going to be a miracle an impossible, unbelievable miracle. And it was at that time that God does what God did. And in Luke one twenty six, we read, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. This is the story, you know, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David in the line of Abraham, right? That's that's what he's doing. He's setting it up. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And so in the end, God kept his unbelievable incoherent and seemingly impossible promise that he made to Abraham 2,100 years before. He did it. He did it. And so when you think about the Christmas story, the events surrounding the first Christmas aren't really that believable when you think about the 2,100 years before. The Christmas story that would bless all nations, right, that, 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 it, that God would bless all the nations through Abraham, that's the one that seems more impossible. That's the one that seems unbelievable. That's the one that seems incoherent because it was so different than what any nation had ever done. And that the Jewish God would be worshipped throughout the world that this Jewish God, the, the God of these people that were conquered time after time after time, that couldn't even keep their little tiny nation, as, as nice as it was, couldn't even keep it together. This is the God that people all around the world would worship. That this was all foretold over 2,000 years before Jesus shows up. And here's the great thing is that through Christmas, through Christmas, we are reminded about this remarkable, seemingly impossible story that happened, that God did bless all the nations. And now 2,000 years after Jesus comes, we are still seeing God do that. The story of Christmas is still unfolding, even whenever we're reminded that some of the circumstances seem to the contrary when bad things happen. When we're, when we feel like we're, we're getting besieged and conquered and we feel like things are just not going our way. We remember that God is still active. God is still active and not, not only that, but he's interested He's interested in the things in your, the things going on in your life and in my life. God is interested in you. He has not taken his hand off the wheel. He has not gotten out of the car. God is still active and he's still interested and he knows and he's still keeping his promises. You see, it's Christmas time that we remember that God can still be trusted. You can trust God. You can trust God with your family, with your finances, with your life, with your career, with your relationships. You can trust God. It may not look the way you think, but God will keep his promises because he always has. Even when he makes them and they seem impossible, Even when he makes them and they seem incoherent, even when he makes them and they seem unbelievable, God keeps his promises. He can be trusted. And so this Christmas time, it turns out that the whole world needed Christmas. The whole world needed to be blessed through Jesus. The whole world needed Christmas. But you know who else did? God needed Christmas. If you want to hear more about that, we'll see you next week. Love you guys.